This is the Graceful Atheist Podcast. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Graceful Atheist Podcast. My name is David, and I am trying to be the Graceful Atheist. Welcome back to the podcast. I hope you missed me as we're on the summer schedule, which is roughly every other week. I do hope you will consider rating and reviewing the podcast in the Apple Podcast Store to help others discover the podcast. I'm very excited about the interviews that I have lined up over the next couple of months, so continue to tune in to hear people's stories of deconversion and their work in the deconversion space. My guest today is Alice Gretchen of the Dare to Doubt blog. On the Dare to Doubt blog, Alice is focused on millennials who are detaching from harmful belief systems. Her blog has a number of resources for people going through the doubting, deconstructing, and deconverting process. As you'll hear in the interview, Alice describes the blog as what she would write to her younger self, what she needed, what she wanted when she was going through the deconversion process. In my conversation with Alice, we hit a number of subjects, including religious trauma syndrome, guilt about former gullibility, purity culture, Christian courtship, and Alice's almost arranged marriage that was the beginning of her doubts. Before I start the interview, just wanted to make two comments. One is we talk about the Foursquare Church, and I mention that it is Amy Simple McPherson who started the Foursquare Church. I couldn't think of her name when we were in the middle of conversation. Just want to make sure that that was clear. And then also just to apologize to Alice, as I went through the editing process, I realized that I had interrupted her and derailed her a couple of times. She recovers quite nicely uh, and handles that with grace. I greatly appreciate Alice's honesty and her heart for people, and I think that comes through really well in this interview. So I hope you enjoy Alice Gretchen. Alice, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Alice, I have found out about your blog online. Your blog is called Dare to Doubt. And I'm just really impressed with the work that you're doing there. Uh, You've got a, a number of resources on there for people who are going through the doubting, the deconstructing, the deconverting process. And I was just really anxious to to have you on, so I'm really glad you're here. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Very cool. Uh, so before we get into the work that you do, I'd, I'd really like to hear your story. I call our both our spiritual testimonies and our deconversion stories our origin stories. It really tells a lot about who you are as a person, of what that process was like. So tell us, what was your faith tradition growing mm-hmm. up, and when did the doubt start to creep in? Oh, man. Yeah, lately I've been thinking of them in my head as died again stories instead of born again stories. Yes. <laughs> but like it's once you're through that died again, it, it is born again in an entirely different way. Yeah. So my origin story, the so I was born into a Christian home. I never remember accepting Jesus. He was just always there. God was yeah. always there. By the time I was born, my parents were involved with uh, the Foursquare Church, which Mm -hmm. has its roots in Pentecostalism, for those who don't know. Um, It's a very Holy Spirit friendly thing. And then when I was a toddler, my parents were missionaries in Asia for a little bit, uh, less than a year. I don't remember a whole lot. Mm -hmm. And then when we got back to the States, my dad pastored a Foursquare Church for, I want to say, almost a couple of years in Illinois. And that's where I spent most of my childhood, in Rockford, Illinois. When I was about nine or 10, I don't know if you've heard of this, it's a little niche, there was this spiritual revival movement that Mm, started sweeping over the world called the Toronto Blessing. Um, Some people called it the Renewal or the Father's Blessing or the Laughing Revival. There were a lot of names for it, but my parents were very moved by the conferences that they attended. And there it was like the Pentecostal was notched up to like 10 with people like having seizures and rolling around and praying in tongues and having visions and ecstatic dancing and weeping for days and uncontrollable laughter, like very, uh, so I, my parents always told me that we were Mm, non-denominational and then as an adult, I looking back, I'm like, Oh, I think the media classified us as evangelical and then Christian media outlets would use the term charismatic. So 
but I always grew up being like, oh, we're just Christians. We're just non-denominational. You know, my parents were very, um, very adamant that you, you couldn't pin God. He was so mysterious, so big, so multifaceted that to like try to put him in the box of a denomination um, was kind of limiting the possibilities of love and the mm. movement of the Holy Spirit. So that's uh, that's a sort of nutshell version of like the definition, I guess, or lack thereof, of okay. my my faith background. So I have a, I have a fair amount in common there. Although I didn't grow up as a Christian, I became Christian in my late teens. Uh, I was in an <laughs> Assemblies of God uh, church, which is kind of kissing cousins to Foursquare. Totally, I had a lot of friends who were, yeah. <laughs> and I had a lot of friends in in Foursquare, and, and my favorite story from that is that. Uh, the local Foursquare when I was growing up would have, when things got really rolling, they'd bring out this thing they called the river, which was this giant ribbon that was like four feet wide and like 20 feet long. And they'd be flowing it up and down and people were dancing. And anyway, that's my, that's my favorite uh, Foursquare charismatic story. So, yes. <laughs> so I, I relate. Oh man, it is so filled with terms like that, like jumping into the river, being cleansed by the fire. It's all like fire and river and holy rain. And yeah burning and refining oil like there's there's so many fire water terms i yeah, find in the charismatic yeah. community and and do you remember the, the name is escaping me but the foursquare was started by a woman who called herself a prophet I, I am blanking on her name i'm sure someone can tell us uh but anyway that's that's kind of uh, I, I always found that interesting i think we'll get into the topic here in a minute about women in the church and women in atheism but the foursquare church was was started by a woman and uh, i always found like the, that my denomination was uncomfortable with that. I thought that was interesting. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Did you ever, you know, were you interested in doing ministry, worship, those kinds of things? Or was that, or were you? Yes, I was. So to kind of pick up from, from that point when the, the Toronto blessing revival kind of hit our, my family's life took a big detour. My parents felt called by God to give up worldly employment to sell our house and most of our belongings wow. and to just hit the road and follow him living by faith that God would provide. And I'm sure you're familiar with the Bible verse about, um, look at the birds of the air. If your heavenly father feeds them, don't you think that much more he'll feed you? And so yeah. it was a very, sometimes I like to say they called it living by faith. Mm -hmm. For me, it was homelessness <laughs> <laughs> for, for a period. I yes. totally understand where they're hearts were. I shouldn't say that. I'm learning to more understand where their hearts were mm. um, as we've as we've been talking about it more as adults from the different places that we're at now. Mm -hmm. But it was it, that was a period. And then it ended with us settling when I was a teenager in Kansas City, Missouri, which is where the more evangelical thing kind of took off. And of course, when I was a teenager, that's when the purity culture aspect is drilled into you, as, as right. you know, when, when you found God as a teenager. So I, I was homeschooled my whole life. So the only outlet I had for friends was through my youth group. Right. We not know very many people who were not Christians or involved in the church in some way. So as a result of that, many of my goals as a young adult became geared toward ministry. I wanted to be a missionary and I graduated high school early. I got my GED because I was homeschooled. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be a nurse. And so I was doing all the prereqs for nursing school with the plan to join YWAM, the youth with a mission. Mm -hmm. And, or, so they have, they have a discipleship training school in Perth, Australia with like a healthcare emphasis that I was intrigued by. And then I was also looking into mercy ships, which is like doctors without borders, but Christian edition. Right. And, right. Uh, <laughs> I've had friends in both of those ministries. Yeah. 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 So that was, that was, uh, that was the plan. And then as a teenager, I, was approached by modeling scouts who kept wanting me to get into the modeling industry somehow. And my family and I were living in Colorado when I was 16. We moved around a lot. Okay. And so at this point we're in Colorado, I'm 16. I don't think there's any way my parents are going to let me start modeling at all uh, right, right. because it's just so worldly. That's worldly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so worldly. And then of course, as a female, I mean, men too, absolutely. But you're selling sex. Yeah. So, I don't know. I just never thought there'd be a way. I was even sure I wanted to do it. I, my own feelings were so conflicted. They viewed it as a door God was opening. They're like, you know, maybe this is the way God's going to provide money for all, all the rest of the things. And I was like, totally. Interesting. Yeah, it was interesting. And, and I think they, they, they knew that 
maybe I could have a, a lucrative future in there. And at the very least, like, what did I have to hurt by doing it? And then I had my own inner wrestling too. Of, oh man, like, what if this is a door Satan's opening? It feels so good. You know, I, I, get, to, <laughs> I get to play dress up and be pretty. And so, you know, I had this whole complex about being like a wayward woman. Oh no. <laughs> so, but it seems like, you know, if God didn't want me to do it, maybe, maybe the door wouldn't be open and simultaneously the doors were closing for nursing and that other path. And of course I, mm-hmm. I was looking at life through an entirely mystical lens back then. Yeah. Signs. These are things are pointing you. Oh in. yes. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing occurs without coincidence. And That's so right. everything is either an open door or a closed door. You know, there's no, and certainly no personal will in that, at least for me. Yeah. Uh, my parents found God as adults. I grew up in it and it, um, we've had interesting conversations about the differences even just neurologically speaking, yeah. like that, that can lead to. But anyway, can, can I just t- touch on that real quick? That's been yes. a, a very much a reoccurring theme of late. Uh, as I mentioned, I came to this in my late teens, and I feel like I was spared the brunt of the trauma that I see a lot of people that uh, go through who are raised in particularly very conservative evangelical Christianity as children. Mm-hmm. And even part of my deconversion story was when my daughters were old enough to start thinking about baptism. I was deeply conflicted about this. This is when I was all the way in too. I was a full blown believer, but there was something about it that felt really wrong to me. These children who couldn't possibly understand the decision that they were making, mm. being encouraged by myself and my wife mm-hmm. to, to go through baptism. So anyway, I just feel like that's that's definitely an interesting point that those of you who were grown up in it as a child when you're taught as a five-year-old that these things are literally true that's uh that's hard to shake even in your adulthood now it is uh it is definitely because i think when you're an adult you you can better pick and choose what parts you're gonna go with and what parts you don't like Mm -hmm. uh for example i recently found out my mom never believed in hell and for me that was like very much the bottom line of my faith and the reason i stayed in it for so long Uh and she just she she's like you know for me it was all about the love you know and like i just kind of tuned those parts out and she was kind of shocked that i couldn't do the same i was like I never knew that about you, first of all, back right. then. Second of all, <laughs> everyone else around me was telling me these things. Yeah. So, And I don't think she realized how much of that fear-based indoctrination was being instilled in her kids. She's since expressed, you know, she might have tried to shield us a little bit more, at least offered a balanced alternative perspective. But yeah, that's one of the differences between yeah. someone finding faith as an adult versus that is all you know. And right. and like I said, being homeschooled, it was that extra insular layer of not really getting to meet or talk with people about any alternative, right? Uh, any alternative way of life. I will just say that I, again, I relate more to your mom's experience in the sense mm, that yeah. uh, when I came to it, I, I was very much, I call myself a grace junkie, right? The reason, the reason I became a Christian was the, the grace that I saw in the New Testament and in Jesus specifically. And I was looking around the church going, why do you think this? Why do you think that? <laughs> and, mm. uh, and I very much did the same thing where it's like hell and the negative sides I just minimized and I focused very much on the love. And, and I now recognize it's just one more way I'm privileged. <laughs> 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 that, uh, oh. <laughs> I, you know, that spared me the, the harder parts that I see many people that have to go through again, trauma from trying to recover. Sure. But you know, I would imagine too, that you have a different set of challenges because we, we mentioned, we were discussing briefly, you know, the atheism community, sometimes at least if you're first exposed to it is so very combative and ridiculing. And I would imagine that a unique set of challenges that someone who does find faith as an adult faces would include like, why didn't you see it the first time? You know, like, yeah. why didn't you see the signs? You, you, yeah. you know, you hadn't drunk, you weren't raised on the Kool-Aid, so to speak. So like, why did you ever right. come to it? And that also I would imagine could, you know, if as in the case of yourself, you do eventually leave that also later on in your life as an adult, it's, I don't know. I'm, I'm sure that has its own, its own version of unique, specialized trauma, deconstructing, whatever word you want to that's, by the way, very good judo. You've just pushed it back onto me. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think you'd be a good podcast host. Uh, <laughs> uh, but just to answer that, uh, I talk about a lot that what is unique 
to the deconversion process in general, and then mine specifically, is a sense of almost shame or guilt for mm. having been gullible in that I should have known better and really releasing that, letting go of, you know, it was more about the community. It was more about my need to be, be a part of a group, to feel belonging. Those were the drivers that pushed me, pushed me into that, but definitely felt poke fun at myself for, you know, yeah, I should have figured that out a little sooner because I was in it for 27 years or so. So it was a long time before I figured things out. Yeah. Oh man. I, so a couple of themes that have come up so far in our conversation keep reminding me of what I've been learning about cults. And I was <laughs> going to try to steer clear of using this word around yeah. discussing about Christianity because I know it's very inflammatory. And I certainly do not think that all expressions of faith automatically mean they're cultish. Mm -hmm. um, not at all. However, I do think, you know, we're talking about the, the difference between finding faith as an adult or a child. I've been learning in the cult community, there's like first generation cult member and second generation cult member, yeah. um, as opposed to adults who joined a destructive group, you know, after right. their mind had already had a chance to develop. And then feeling like you should have known better. I find that even with kids that were raised in religion or in a particular spiritual path, a lot of them, just like many cult members, join another faith slash cult. Mm -hmm. And then when they leave the second time, they feel even more angry with themselves for having been duped again. Like I, I know people who, one of my good friends, he grew up in Calvary Chapel. Right, yeah. And w w reaped heaps of shame on himself when years later after having left that, he found himself in an acting class cult <laughs> and <laughs> okay. uh, they exist. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I've had many bones to pick with acting classes because of that. And I, yeah. all of my red flags start going off Yeah, because it's a very emotional, vulnerable place. That reminds me a lot of charismatic, weird Christianity. <laughs> any, you know, you make an excellent point that any group can have an authoritarian bent. And especially yeah. if you have a, a leader who it wants to wield that power and yeah. work against the vulnerability and the honesty of the people, the members of that group. It can be anything. All in the name of goodness, of course. Right, All right. <laughs> Self-improvement, you know, or surrender, you know, and, and it's so, so easy to exploit that even unintentionally. I think many people who lead destructive groups really do not have bad intentions. Yeah. And that's something that I think I know for myself, I've gotten a lot of peace from acknowledging and so it's, it's helped lessen a lot of the anger and confusion was like, oh, of course they had good intentions. Right. Everyone does. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's a, a human experience. Yeah. Yeah. I think very few people knowing we are like, you know what, let's see how we can exploit people, use their emotions against them, take advantage of their vulnerability and make money while we <laughs> Right. You know? Like I don't, I don't think that that mindset is as common. I totally agree. Yeah. And, and I think for many people who do go into ministry, uh, pastors and lay leaders, when they gain that sense of a power, it unwittingly, you know, they're, they didn't intend to wield it against people, but it, that's what winds up happening. Right. So I think we've, we've skipped ahead just a little bit. I want to circle back just for a moment. <laughs> okay. I want to get to where, when did the doubt start to creep in, but maybe you've got more story to tell of the faith experience as well. So this is good practice for me to learn to tell my story semi-chronologically. My brain has the tendency to like to jump around. No at problem, a lot of no problem. <laughs> um, so I would say, so I moved, so modeling led to an acting opportunity in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Again, I saw it as a door God was opening. So I moved out to LA a month before I turned 17. That first year I started booking right away, which at the time I did not really know how lucky I was to even just have an agent or a manager. Uh -huh. Many people live in LA for years before they get those things. And I started working. So the biggest turning point for me was what felt like an arranged marriage. Oh my. <laughs> so okay. that same year when I was 17, a guy from my youth group in Colorado also moved to LA. Mm -hmm. Now we were both, we were both from the same church. Um, we both grew up in purity culture, me a little bit more so than him, it would seem. Mm -hmm. And all of the Christian courtship books from I Kiss Dating Goodbye mm -hmm. to um, When God Writes Your Love Story by Eric and Leslie Woody, like all, all of the Christian courtship books I'd ever read said very clearly how my love life was going to play out. Like 
Right. Rule number one, you absolutely don't date. You don't encourage lust. You don't have lustful thoughts. You don't look at men or women lustfully. You don't, you know, like once you do start a courtship, you wait until it's the person that God's revealed as your future spouse. And then God's will is affirmed through other elders that he places in your life. So it's not like you just have to rely on your own self to know, oh, maybe this is the person that my flesh wants to marry. And I'm just going to say, God put on my heart that this is my spouse. Right. <laughs> it's affirmed by other elders in your life. And yeah, yeah. like often your parents, if you have godly parents or maybe youth pastors. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, living in LA, this guy from my youth group back in Colorado comes out, we become really good friends. We've mm -hmm. never dated. And one day he, uh, he started acting a little jealous um, over some guy friends that I was hanging out with. And uh -huh. I was like, what is going on, man? You know, like what, what's going on? He's like, well, God showed me that you're my future wife. <laughs> oh, and no. I was just shocked and <laughs> just, just shocked because, and I, of course believed him. Like it's, it's so easy in retrospect to look back and be like, how, how did I believe that? You know, mm. but I was primed for that revelation. Yeah. Yeah. And I knew he would not say something like this lightly. And to this day, I think he totally believed and was sincere that that sure. was the revelation at that time. And um, long story short, he called my dad to ask his blessing. My dad gave it and said he heard from God. So this guy heard from God. My oh, dad man. heard from God. And the guy's mom heard from God that we were supposed to get married. And I was like, wow, it's how it must be, you know, and, and meanwhile, <laughs> I am feeling utterly shattered inside oh, and completely no. betrayed because I was told that if you are faithful to your future spouse and if you do obey God and let him write your love story, he's going to reward you with like the most amazing wild romance beyond all your dreams. Right. And I completely believed it. And when it, this reveal was this guy that I cared very much for as a friend, but had no romantic feelings for whatsoever, I was. I, it, it's hard to articulate in words how stunned I was and also how betrayed I felt because I couldn't acknowledge the betrayal to myself because that would mean that God had tricked me or that I felt tricked by God because, you know, God doesn't trick you. It's just wow. our selfish wants that make us think that. Yeah. So <laughs> it's a, it's, it, it was just a total mind fuck of emotions. I bet. Yeah, man. You know, is this is this a test from God? Is this like uh, when he told Abraham to slay his son? Is God just trying to see if I'm willing and maybe I don't have to marry this guy? Like I don't know. Like it it was just all of my programming just was at war with itself, and yeah. inside, and it was so hard for me to even know what my heart wanted. So I would say that that was the first time I really felt shaken and doubts came into play because it was like is this really God? It, it definitely seems to be really God. He told three different people. I'm the only one he didn't tell, but that made sense to me because God had never told me anything. Interesting. I had never felt God. I had never heard from God. Well, everyone around me all growing up was feeling love or having visions or praying in tongues. I faked it. <laughs> it was I love it. Real for me ever not once yeah. and I would desperately try to make it real. Like I thought one time when a friend prayed over me in youth group, I cried because of what she was saying, but yeah. because I associated displays of emotion like laughter and crying with the touch of God, I thought, oh, maybe, maybe this is God touching me. And in my heart, I knew, no, I'm just crying because I'm in a really rough place right now. My friend's love is really moving to me. It's not right. God. It's right. my friend. <laughs> but I was desperate to try to, to try to look for any sign that maybe God wasn't leaving me out because that was part of my, my own complex as a Christian was always feeling like I'm doing all the right things. I was such a conscientious girl. I was yeah. the best Christian I could possibly try to be. And like, I repented for so many of my thoughts and everything. Like I, I was just so, so earnest. And can I, can I jump in here and just respond yeah. to a couple of things, a couple of things that you say that really, really speak volumes. One is I've heard this before of you're fully dedicated. You're trying to do everything right. And you have, you watch the people around you that are experiencing something. That they're, they're that they are claiming is is God, and you're not feeling that, and it's it's actually your honesty that's driving you not to fake it all the time, <laughs> or to accept something that is less than deeply profound, mm -hmm. because you're looking for the true thing, you're looking for the real thing, and you're recognizing that it isn't there. 
Uh, so th that I just find incredibly ironic. And and then two, the, the story of the uh, relationship is fascinating in that everyone else had heard from God, quote unquote, I'm doing quotes mm -hmm. here, <laughs> except you. Uh, and I wonder how many people have experienced that. And I think that's probably, that happens probably on both sides, but probably more for women where the men in their lives are saying, oh, this thing is is from God and feel completely obligated to something that you have no emotional attachment to. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. And that just must be uh, terrifying inside. It is terrifying. It didn't feel terrifying in theory because it was all I knew. And mm -hmm. I should also clarify, my mom had not heard this from God, but by that point, my mom had stopped going to church. Mm, so okay. it was easy for my mind to invalidate her mm -hmm. because it was like, well, you don't even go to church anymore. So of course Satan might be using me because my mom is actually the reason why I ended up getting out of that engagement. Okay. It lasted for two months. And the whole time I just faked happiness. Like, I don't think I've ever acted harder in my whole life. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and, uh, you can accept the Emmy. <laughs> and, you know, I don't think I was doing a very good job because the guy that I was betrothed to, he could sense something wasn't quite right because I didn't want to do premarital counseling, which is, you know, par for the course in Christian courtship. And uh, I, was tra I was on a trip with my family away from him. And my mom just came up to me one day and she's like, like, are you happy? Like, you don't seem happy. You don't mm. see yourself. And I was like, no, I'm totally fine. You know? And she's like, you know, do you, you know, you don't have to marry. And I'm like, because I couldn't lie to my mom, you know, like she yeah. knew she, she knew something, but even then I still wondered if Satan was using her to deter me from the, from the path that God had so clearly laid out and triple confirmed. So, you know, I, my mom, even though I'm so grateful to her now, it still took me a, a month after that conversation to find the courage to leave because um, my mom's version of God at that point was the God that would not want me to marry a man I didn't love. Mm. But the Bible's full of stories of girls who had to marry men they didn't love. Right. <laughs> but I don't. I can't. I still to this day can't think of a single Bible story where the girl married a guy because she loved him. Yeah. Maybe the guy love lusted her like Jacob and Rachel or whatever. But we don't know how Rachel felt about him. Uh, right. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know. It's um, it's so I, I don't know. That just it wasn't uh, the, my ideas of God, even when I did believe in him never quite panned out to be what I thought that they would be. And so my arranged marriage felt like nothing different. It was just extra painful because it's a life commitment. Wow. Yeah. Long story short, I finally find the courage to break up with the guy and I. Good for you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, I, I still wasn't 18 yet. I was still 17 and like, I'd never had a boyfriend and, and I, I felt I felt so terrified in the months that followed because I had deliberately gone against God's very clear will. And I was sure that Satan was going to get me at any minute because I'd gone against God's plan, which meant Satan could now get a foothold on my life if he wanted to. And mm -hmm. I thought maybe I'd get cancer. I thought maybe I'd get in a car crash. I live in LA. So I thought maybe an earthquake will come punish me, you know, and it's all very egotistical sounding in retrospect, like, oh yeah, God's going to make an earthquake happen just because of me. <laughs> no, but you know, again, I have, I've heard that kind of thing over and over. I remember people would say, oh, I didn't do my Bible study today. And that's why my car broke down. And yeah. I'd be like, what God are you serving? <laughs> like, that doesn't make it, even as a Christian, I thought that's insane. You yeah. know? So, but I yeah. mean, and I don't mean to say that about you, but I mean, I, 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 appreciate, I appreciate that that is the kind of environment that as a kid, you grow up, you make those connections and you feel like, you know what, I'm going to get punished if I don't do the right thing. Well, it's cause and effect at its most magical thinking form, mm -hmm. you know, because there obviously is like cause and effect, but through the lens of mysticism and meaning and signs and, you know, God's will versus Satan's will, like it's it all, it's to this day, I, I have difficulty sometimes i should say I, to, to this day i sometimes catch that same wiring that mm -hmm. the, uh, sort of black and white thinking mentality yeah. that i've really made an effort to try 
and just take note of and let go and try to look for the gray areas more. And I've, I've become quite comfortable with it now, but it took me a long time. I've, I've been, I stopped believing in God 12 years ago. So I've been out for a little bit now. And even though leaving that arranged marriage was ultimately what got me to doubt three years, it wasn't until three, three and a half years after that, that I was unable to sustain faith at all completely. And so I would say that ending my betrothal was when I ended my relationship with evangelical Christianity or charismatic Christianity. And for a long time, I really wanted to be a liberal Christian. I wanted to be a progressive Christian. I wanted to be the kind of Christian that that believed that God loved gays and they were going to go to heaven too. And I wanted (laughs) to believe that that I didn't have to go to church and I didn't go to church. You know, I, for a long time, my faith was still really important to me. I allowed myself to explore other spiritual paths as well, like Buddhism, Taoism, Hinduism, Judaism a little bit more Mm because Judaism and Christianity are very similar in some regards, at least old Testament wise. And there's more openness for questioning in Judaism. I can, I can see, I can see where some people Mm -hmm. might be attracted to that. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Yeah. And then, you know, you're, you're LA kind of spirituality that yeah. has like crystals <laughs> and uh, chakras yeah. and, and stuff like that. Past life therapists. I definitely saw one. <laughs> <laughs> nice. kind of just, just trying to open my mind and yeah. let myself learn about things that I'd never let myself learn about before because it was all, if it wasn't from the Bible, it was a temptation of the devil. So I never let myself learn. And I love to learn. It's my, it's my purest joy is when I'm learning something that I find fascinating. So yeah. I let myself do that. And along the way, there were some things that I really wanted to be true for me. I really wanted to be a Buddhist or I really wanted to be a Taoist. Those those really spoke to me for some reason. And Wicca too, like nature worship. But for me, they all required faith. And for me, the bottom line was I became not so great at lying to myself anymore. Mm. And I knew when something was not true for me and I knew because I recognized the muscles that I trained when I was trying to make it so, when I was trying to twist my gut feelings to justify um, whether I am feeling God or a spirit or a connection or a, something to the divine. You know, I, I could tell when I was bullshitting myself. Yeah. So, I'm so good at it. And like I said, I, I was just not so good at it anymore, which, I, which freaked me out. But one day when I was about 20 or 21, so what it, what it was for me that like really closed the door on faith for me was I started watching this documentary called Jesus Camp. Mm-hmm. Have you, seen it? you know, I haven't seen it, but I'm, I'm vaguely familiar with it. Yeah. But go ahead and describe it for us. So Jesus Camp is a documentary that mostly follows these kids in Kansas, in, and I think Kansas City or Missouri, near, near there in the Midwest, watching just 10 minutes of that documentary and I couldn't even watch it anymore. I was shaking because it was like watching my childhood. I was watching these kids with their hands raised and tears streaming from their closed eyes. I was wondering how many of them are faking it because these adults are not going to go away and leave them alone until they get, until the kids give the performance that's expected of them. Right. Maybe for some kids, they really are having some sort of genuine mystical experience, but you know, they can't, I I know I wasn't, so I can't help but wonder. I do want to be really careful. I do believe that mm-hmm. there are people who truly have a mm-hmm. an experience of some kind. My my argument is that they are attributing it to the wrong thing, right? It, they're attributing it to an external entity, to a god, when in fact it is the environment. It's the the peer pressure around them. It's you know what have you. And the human mind is easily primed. It's easily manipulated and. Mm-hmm. But I guess what I want to say is that that people do have real experiences. I think your experience was also valid in that you were recognizing that this thing wasn't real <laughs> mm-hmm. and maybe had a little more self-awareness, right? But uh, I, I just want to make sure that we're not making a blanket statement over everyone. For example, just to be clear, my wife is a believer and she very much, you know, her it's so real to her. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the reason I have not really... I, I don't go after her on on her faith at all, is that it is such a foundational part of who she is, mm-hmm. and it is a daily reality for her. Mm-hmm. I'm very cognizant of, because I love her, her for who she is, and that is a part of her, to accept that part of her and to love her in her entirety, right? 
That is so beautiful. I just have to say that is so beautiful, both on the part of you and your wife, you know, because yeah. you are unequally yoked. That's as they exactly say. right. Yeah, it's a, cha- <laughs> it's a challenge. So I don't want to make I don't want to make it sound like it's all roses and things. You know, it's hard. It's very hard. I'm sure. I'm sure. That's uh, the subject of an entire other podcast. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> but I want I guess what I'm trying to get to is I've talked to so many people now and both are true, right? People that have mm-hmm. had an experience that so feels so real to them that mm-hmm. they cannot distinguish it from what we might describe as reality. Absolutely. Yeah. And people like yourself who are in the middle of the same sets of peer pressure, the same emotional influencers and going, yeah, but this isn't quite right. <laughs> and, yeah. and so both of those or in the spectrum in between is all possible. Yeah. I a hundred percent agree. I totally derailed you. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no worries at all. I, I totally agree. I think, um, and that was actually one of the biggest parts of my healing was learning about mystical experiences, I've mm-hmm. come to call them. And or some people call them religious experiences or psychedelic experiences. Yeah. yeah. Um, the kind I'm, I say mystical experiences as a broader blanket. I have had psychedelic experiences that mm-hmm. have shown me for the first time, even just an inkling of what everyone else was getting to experience. I'm like, oh, this is what it is. And as yeah. I've done a lot of research into the neuroscience of faith and spirituality, it's everything you just said is totally validated. Like we're, we're um, I think some of us are more susceptible to mm-hmm. having spontaneous, sober, mystical experiences, yeah, like no, yes. no magic mushrooms involved. Yeah. And some of us are just not wired for that. And that doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you. It doesn't mean you're broken. It doesn't mean you're a sinner. Because I always thought there was, it, it must be because there's some mystery sin in my life. Right. Even though I was such a good kid. Yeah, yeah. I was a brat sometimes, but I was <laughs> such a good kid, guys. And yeah. like, I, I felt like, man, it must just be some, some hidden sin that like I is hidden even for myself. And that must be why God's not touching me. This is part of the trauma as well, is that, you know, if things go well and you do good, it's it, God gets credit. And if things yeah. don't go well, it's your fault. You've done it wrong. Somehow. Totally. So, and you're, po- you're totally putting that on yourself Ugh, while, yeah. while you're experiencing it. Yeah. Credit is a one-way street. It's, yeah, it's, it's painful. My point is I 100% agree with you that I think some people genuinely are having a mystical experience while others like myself are faking it. And when I was watching Jesus Camp, that documentary, it just brought back all of that pain of never feeling God's love and always feeling rejected and mm. left out. And, and it made me, like I said, I couldn't finish it. I didn't finish that documentary until years later, wow. but that was what made me get, I got really angry for several weeks, uh, maybe even a couple of months. And I was just so angry. And even though I looked at other spiritual paths by then, like I said, they all required faith. Mm-hmm faith of some sort. And to me, faith means something that you accept as truth without really believing it, without really being convinced of it, without knowing it. It's a, it's, it's a, that's why it's called faith. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it's a, it, I, I could tell, like, I was like, oh man, like, am I just, I'm just leaving one faith thing for another faith thing. And none of it feels true to me. And I just needed to be honest about that. And I got, I gave God his last test and, yeah. uh, he failed. Yeah. <laughs> and then after that, it was like about a month of exhilarating freedom, followed by years of therapy. Crash <laughs> <laughs> and burn. Like I, I felt so high on life, like during the first month that I became an atheist, basically. Mm-hmm. And because I could wear whatever I wanted, I didn't have to worry about anything. I, I, I never ever wanted to feel the emotion of shame ever mm-hmm, again. Mm-hmm. And after that, I started having like suicidal panic attacks and I had no idea why. I did not at oh all correlate that to leaving my faith. That was, this was in like 2007 or 2008. I didn't learn about religious trauma syndrome until like 2013, I mm. want to say, 2013 or 2014. Yeah. All I knew was that I needed help and, of, and the Christian mentality in me tried to tell me, of course, this is what happens. You know, this is Satan attacking you because you left God. And yeah. there were a few moments that I could tell my heart wanted to relapse back into faith and be like, okay, God, I'm sorry. I do believe in you. But again, I could not lie to myself anymore because I knew I was lying. I don't think faith is a choice. I know many people do. That's just not been my truth. I chose and chose and it was just never real to me. Um, mm-hmm. I think yeah. some people can choose and something is real to them. It's just 
I, don't, I, don't, I never had that luxury, <laughs> but that's okay because yeah. I am so much happier where I am now. And I am so, I feel so much more love and so much more peace as an atheist than I ever felt as a Christian ever. Yeah. No, that's amazing. And to touch on what you just said there, I've always said that belief is not a choice. And I know there are some, you can get into the philosophical weeds, but just on a certain, on the, you know, practical level, you are either convinced of a thing that it is true or you're not convinced. And you can be somewhere in between that, you know, in the process one way or the other, but you really don't have the choice. You could no, no longer, you know, and, this, and the question to pose to say a Christian is, okay, choose to believe in Islam. Mm. It's, it's just not possible. You can't volitionally decide I'm going to, to believe this thing. And so mm -hmm. the reverse is also true when we come to a point where we can no longer believe. And I, I love the language you use. You said you could no longer sustain faith, I believe is the way you said it. That's how I felt. Like I couldn't, I couldn't keep the plate spinning. I was trying so hard to keep the plate spinning to make this thing work. Mm -hmm. And I went through the, read through the Bible again about two years before, just, you know, reading apologists. I was trying so hard. <laughs> and, yes. I, like, and, your, and your story sounds very familiar, right? Like you're trying to do the right thing and yet it's just not working. And at some point yes. you have to admit yourself, I don't believe. Totally. And the only thing that, that reassured me when I would have those moments of anti-doubt, I guess we'll call it, like mm -hmm, no longer mm -hmm. doubting my faith, but doubting my decision to leave, the, what calmed me down was reminding myself, you know what, if there is a God that loves me, if this God is real, then he gets it. He understands that this is just my journey right now. And after all, if he really did want to make himself known to me and he's all powerful and he could, if he could have and chose not to, then he has to understand that this is the result of that. Mm -hmm. And of course I was still terrified because I was no longer acting on faith. And it seemed yeah. like that was, that was the requirement to get into heaven. Um, and then I thought when I would get angry again, I was like, you know what? I don't want to believe in that kind of God anymore. Anyway, fuck him. <laughs> yeah. Fuck him for making this one way to get into heaven. You know, yes, like that, yeah. that is not the kind of God. No, that's not a God of love. And so I would have these yeah. little conversations with my Christian self and my non-Christian self and and using the Bible for both arguments. And right. I, I love that. I love, I love to this day utilizing the Bible or other spiritual texts or non-spiritual texts to argue and counter-argue because I, I really like to feel like I can understand something, mm -hmm. <laughs> even though yeah. I know there's so little in life that can't actually be. <laughs> I like the process of trying. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Just understanding to my own mind's satisfaction when possible. Yeah. Let's touch on one more theme that you brought up, and that is often people go through what you've described where, okay, I'm no longer an evangelical Christian. Maybe I'm a liberal Christian, or maybe I'm a Buddhist, or maybe I'm a Taoist. And I felt like I came crashing through those pretty fast. Like for me, it was just, just my personality. Mm -hmm. I describe it as, you know, when you see a movie and somebody's hits every balcony on the way down you know, before they hit the ground, I felt like I just came crashing through those things all the way to the ground of science as an epistemology, as understanding how do I figure out what's true and what's not. Mm -hmm. And for you, it was, it was the recognition that each of those things still required this idea of faith. How did you figure that out? How did you acknowledge to yourself that this was the same thing? Because they all had an afterlife theory and a set of rules for how to get there. Mm -hmm. Buddhism believed in reincarnation and the rules for how to get there was accrue, same with Hinduism, is accruing good karma. Granted, there's many, many different denominations or branches of Buddhism and Hinduism and all, all of that. You know, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. making very broad statements right now. But for me, the bottom line of any faith is... Or, or any spiritual path is boiled down to a belief in an afterlife and how to get there. Yeah. And that I just, I could not convince myself of. I could not convince myself that A, that there is an afterlife and B, that these people knew that this was the way to get there any more than these people over here knew that this was the way to get there. So it completely canceled themselves out. Now I was able to look at, let's say the good parts of all of these different faiths and spiritual paths. And some of them, did resonate with some sort of truth because to me, they're just common sense or, right, right. you know, maybe don't steal. Like, yeah. <laughs> um, not because you're going to accrue bad karma, 
or because it's a sin, but because, you know, it's just, it's, it's just not nice and it has consequences. It makes people angry. It's, it's being dishonest and I feel yucky about myself when I'm dishonest. I don't need any other metaphysical incentive to be a good right. person. It makes me feel shitty when I'm not. So and yeah. I'm a good person, that's my own definition of a good person. Because like I was saying earlier, everyone has good intentions, myself included. So <laughs> yes. yeah, all we can do is try to be honest with ourselves about what's true for us and what's not, and also give ourselves permission to change. I wouldn't be here today if I didn't. And yeah. I always still give myself permission to change. It's hard for me at this point to imagine that I'll believe in, in something again in a classically spiritual or religious sense, but it could happen. Say I yeah. have some horrible accident and I have a near-death experience and I am convinced. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now I've read a lot of accounts of, because that's one of the things that fascinates me <laughs> are people who have had near-death experiences and out of, other out-of-body experiences. Yeah. It definitely intrigues me, but I love, I still love exploring spirituality and things like that, but through the lens of looking at it less is something we need to take on faith and more is something that, ooh, we just haven't quite figured out the scientific tools to measure this sort of experience yet and quantify right. it and, and explain it. So to me, it's just a mystery to be solved, not anything that proves that there's something more. It's like, of course, there's something more, like, but I don't think we need to get mystical about it. Yeah. It's just there's so much that's unknown. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We don't understand consciousness yet. No. And something as deep in consciousness as a near-death experience or a religious mm -hmm. experience, it's like, of course we don't understand it. <laughs> you know? Yeah, but that doesn't make it God. That doesn't yeah, exactly. make it heaven. That doesn't make it something you have to take on faith. It makes it something that we get the joy or burden of figuring out if we want to. Unfortunately, a lot of us want to, and I yeah. love reading their research. Um, yeah. If I could do school over, I would definitely go into neuroscience, and I'd love to work in the field of neurotheology, which is just understanding yeah. the mind science of faith. I think you should do that. Really. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's a fascinating like, field. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love learning about it as a hobbyist. So uh, we set off Mike, and I, jo I joked that you're famous to me because of Dare to Doubt. And it <laughs> turns out that you are also an actress. And so I wanted to touch briefly on the bubble of Hollywood. You kind of hinted at that, that there's you know, definitely a Hollywood spirituality. And, and I'm just curious, are you out as an atheist to, in Hollywood? And is there any back pressure about that for, for your work? Oh, good question. Oh man, this is something I'm sort of in the midst of right now. So thank you for asking. This will give me a chance to kind of articulate that. Mm -hmm. Kind of going through your question step by step. I feel like I only recently came out, out as an atheist this year. Okay. When I did start Dare to Doubt and I wrote one of my blogs was called The A Word because for a long time I said I was agnostic. And again, I couldn't bullshit myself. Yeah. <laughs> I <didn't like> <laughs> Just agnostic. Why am I so scared of this atheist label? Yeah. And there, it's it's when I really ask myself. Of course, it's very clear why I'm. There's there's reasons that I knew and reasons that I didn't know about why I was reluctant to use the label of atheist. Mm -hmm. The first ones being, oh, it just sounds so angry. Yeah. You know, I happen to really love a lot of the angry atheists. I love yeah. Richard Dawkins, and I am so yeah. grateful to Bill Maher and Christopher Hitchens. Like, like yeah. I, I so deeply, deeply value the, the, the place and the voice that, and I adoringly say this, that angry atheism has. Yes, I yeah. do, however, feel, because it, it's, it's so validating. And I kind of look at it like stand-up comedy, which is just fueled by anger yeah. and depression. It is, it, sometimes you do need it to come out that callously. So the point is made because speaking for myself, I watched Bill Maher's Religulous mm -hmm. uh, shortly after I left Christianity. And when I was looking at it, I was like, wow, like these poor Christians, he's mocking them so harsh and ridiculing them so harshly, you know, yeah. and, and you can tell they don't know how to mentally keep up with him or articulate their, their responses. And I felt bad, but the post Christian in me was like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <what he> <laughs> It was like he was this cynical little cheerleader affirming yeah. my decision and my doubt and affirming the illogic that I always saw and didn't dare to question. And so I think that I think that there is a time and place for that. Mm -hmm. However, there's like 
a lot of people are very, the way I feel allergic to the word God, a lot of people are very allergic to the word atheist. Yeah. And I understand that. Not just because of angry atheists or whatever, but because I think people are offended by that label for many reasons that get very deep and subconscious in my opinion, because say you've lost someone, say you're still a Christian and I tell you I'm an atheist. I don't know. Maybe you've just lost your mother last year. Right. You're comforted by thinking she's in a better place right now. And I'm saying, Oh, I'm an atheist essentially saying she's not there, dude. Yeah. She's not in a better place. Even if you're not consciously aware of that thought feeling like that's what I'm attacking. I can't help but think that it must be reverberating through your sense of comfort and make sense of the world in some level. And so I think that's another reason I steered clear of that for a long time because it was like, ooh, you know, like I do understand the role that faith plays in, in the human painting. And I yeah. think that it's often, I, I do see the good parts of faith, the comfort. I think, I think faith is at its best. Faith serves us best in times of deep pain when we need comfort. And yeah. I think grief, what's more painful than, than grief? So it was really hard for me to kind of be honest and say, no, nah, but I'm an atheist. And I was like, why can't I just say I'm agnostic? That's sort of the same thing. It's like, yeah. well, yes, I, I am agnostic. And I, I look at it very literally. Agnostic means like without knowing. And then atheist is like without belief in gods or deities. And mm -hmm. I, one can say I'm both like, well, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I think everyone's an agnostic because mm -hmm. no one really knows anything, but it still felt like a pussy footy way for me to yeah. try to hide my lack of, of beliefs. And when I learned that only 1% of women, especially identify as atheists, I was like, oh my gosh, I need to come out of the closet. Yeah. Cause that I know for a fact through my own personal relationships that there are many females who do not believe in anything, who are not yeah. even spiritual. They are atheists, but, and I respect if that's not a word they're comfortable using for themselves, that's totally fine. But yeah. part of the reason it wasn't comfortable for me and maybe why it's not comfortable for them is because it's still not safe yeah. to be an atheist. And I was shocked when I, I read, when I was writing my article, the A word, I found that like people distrust atheists more than rapists. Yeah. I was like, what? Yeah, it's crazy. What? And I was like, oh my gosh, we need to destigmatize this because it's like, I'm an atheist and I'm a very loved person. And like, I, I love yeah. to give love. And like, I, I think what it boils down to is people still associate spirituality with morality mm -hmm. and a lack of spirituality or faith thereby must mean you have a lack of morality. And of course that's not true. Yeah. But I, in order for me to feel like I could really have a voice in that conversation, I needed to be open about it. I needed to be honest and be, and I recognize this is like old Christian mentality coming back up, but live the example. Uh, yeah. <laughs> be a living example of not Christ's love, but of atheist's love. That's right. Yeah. So I, I, uh, and so that's what gave me the courage to kind of come out and, and say that. So, I mean, good close friends and family members have known that I'm an atheist, but I did, I was not public about it until this yeah. year. Um, and even now, like, it's not like in my Instagram bio. Exactly. You know, yeah. I don't, I don't no, I understand. Like a flag necessarily, but I certainly don't shy from it either. If someone asks, you know, it's right. like, yeah, I'm an atheist. I think for a long time too, I was really scared of adopting any label because I was afraid it would inhibit my sense of freedom to grow and change my mind. And I felt like I fell off such a pedestal of my own making when I left Christianity that I was really scared to adopt another label when I might change more. Right. And you know what? It's like, okay, so I change more. You know what? What's so wrong with that? You know, yeah. if, I, if I change again, I change again. And yeah. fortunately, we still live in a, in a condition where language, semantics, verbal expressions to say, try and describe these like very big, big ideas and feelings like we're so yeah. limited still. So if the word atheist kind of sums up accurately for me where I'm at, then that's what I've gotten comfortable using. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know. I think I, I go through the, the same kind of mental gymnastics, right? Like, so the moniker I use is, is graceful atheist. It could easily be graceful humanist, right? I, I yeah. identify much more as a humanist than an atheist, but the, the sense of the need to destigmatize the word yeah. is part of the reason. And, and, you know, you bring up the very interesting idea that there are so many fewer women who identify that way. 
and probably because of stigmatism, both outside of the atheist community and and inside. Yeah. I loved how you said the angry atheists have a lot to say and it's it's valuable and it's useful, but it's not all that there needs to be to say. And so I think Absolutely. what attracted me to the Dare to Doubt blog and the work that you're doing is, and what I'm trying to do with the podcast as well, is to, to say, you know what, human beings are three-dimensional. We are not Vulcans. We're not purely rationalists. We have to have something more than just a five-point argument mm-hmm. to say that you can live life, you can be a moral person, you can have awe and belonging mm-hmm. and love mm-hmm. and all the things that a person finds within religion outside mm-hmm. of it. Yeah. And we need to expand the horizon of what is possible and what other people perceive of being secular, of being non-religious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I definitely agree that I think there needs to be, and there is, but it needs to be talked about more, uh, such a vast diversity within atheism, the way there is in any religious or non-religious group. You know, mm. there's, there's different branches of atheism, if you will, <laughs> different denominations. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, I think it's interesting to me why, tr- looking at why there's not as many women in the atheist movement, I think that there are. They're mm-hmm. not often given the voice or the platform that some men have clearly had the opportunity to have. Yeah. I think also there's a lot of data to support that women in general, and I hate gender stereotypes, but because there are always, always exceptions, but in general, the data seems to show that women do tend to genuinely be a little more faithful hmm. or have the capacity for spiritual belief than males do. That That's, um, which I find very interesting and I'd like to examine more. And I mean, of course, this research is filled with holes. It's like, well, sure. what kind of controlled studies were there and how did they measure? Were people being honest with themselves when they answered the questionnaire, blah, 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 blah. But it's interesting to me. And I would like to, over the next few years, like try to, that. that's like in my curiosity research project. Yeah, yes. <laughs> that's one of them is trying to understand why are there not more out women atheists? Yeah. And, you know, I've heard stories of there being a lot of misogyny in the atheist community. And, you know, maybe that maybe that does genuinely play a role. I feel like, I, I don't know, like I try not to focus on that too much. Yeah. And to just be who I am and try to encourage other people to be who they are. And it's interesting because with Dare to Doubt, I have tried very hard to make it feel as best as I can welcoming to both an atheist and both someone who's just just beginning to dip a toe outside of the belief waters. Right. And I think it's a very, very tricky balance to find because if I want to make it feel welcoming to, to someone who's, who's say maybe just starting to question and being like, Oh, I don't know if I believe in this part. I believe in this, but not this. They might feel very alienated by something on my site that says atheist or secular right? and think that, Oh no, this is an anti-religion agenda. I can't go here. That's tricky because like you said, I also want to be honest about my atheism while holding space for other people to be honest about wherever they're at, whether that means they end up an atheist themselves or they find a version of Christianity or Mormonism or Islam that's just more true to them. Yeah. And they just had doubts about maybe a particular thing. It's been a tricky thing to navigate. I think at the end of the day, I just built the site that I wanted that I needed when I was in my early 20s that I wish I could have found. That's awesome. Because, (laughs) thank you. Because like, so I I mentioned I was in therapy for three years. This was before religious trauma syndrome uh, had a name. Uh, I was combing through therapists' bios and looking up where they went to school because I was desperately trying to see like, are you a Christian? Are you, are you an atheist? Like, are you going to hurt me more? Are you going to invalidate my pain by telling me, oh, well, have you tried praying about it? Because like I've, I've had that happen right. with therapists of, you know, they don't say they're Christians on their site, but then I go in there and, you know, the Christian in them wants, sees like a, a lost sheep and wants to bring them back to the flock. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, they're only human, you know? Right. So it, it's hard, I think, to separate as much as people might have the best of intentions to, I think it's very hard to separate um, your faith from your practice in such, in that kind of setting. How can you, especially right. when the person who needs the therapy is coming to see about these crises of faith issues. So I, it was really important to me and still is to this day to find a therapist 
who has not gone to a Christian school, Mm -hmm. and I know this is very unfair because I know a lot of atheists might go to a Christian school because the education maybe is better or whatever. But for me, it's just something I've accepted about myself. It could be a button. I don't want to not trust the therapist I'm seeing. So if I have any doubts that maybe I would question their credibility because maybe they believe X, Y, Z, I won't be able to trust them. And then why am I spending my money and time? Yeah. So I'm really happy to find that there are a growing networks of secular therapists. Um, Recovery from Religion mm-hmm. has probably done, they, they have the biggest resource that I know of with um, what they call the Secular Therapy Project Yes, that I feature on Dare to Doubt. I'm so happy that that exists now. I don't think it existed 12 years ago when right. I needed therapy. And so I'm really excited to help other people find these things that maybe they don't even know they're looking for yet. Like I didn't really know that I wanted a secular therapist until I saw a couple that weren't. <laughs> and then I was yeah. like, Oh my gosh, you know, like I don't <laughs> want to give up therapy altogether, but is every therapist spiritual? You know, like I, like I get what they have in common They're you know, a lot of spiritual practices want to help heal people and yeah. wounds of the psyche and stuff. So I, I, they're kind of, it's therapy is very similar to ministry. Yeah, exactly. And they're empathic people. Yeah. And I was going to say, Alice, I've known you for one hour and I can tell you're an incredibly empathic person as well. (laughs) And just to say that your work shows that as well. I think in your writing, you take great pains to make it welcoming to people who they're never going to look up an atheist site, right? But they might admit I'm having doubts and they're going to find your site. And I think in your writing, there's empathy, there's sympathy, you've gone through it as well, and you express that very well. And I'm very hopeful that, that people will find your site. Thank you. You've, you've already mentioned, but you've got that resource page, which I've been meaning to do myself for a long time, but you've done it so well. <laughs> uh, how did you determine what you were going to put on the resource page? Like, Were these things that you used yourself or were it through referrals? So a lot of them I have not used myself because what I endeavored to make with Dare to Doubt So to back up a little bit, I started out knowing that I can't please everyone. Mm -hmm. I need to please myself first and foremost, because that's how I'll come up with something authentic and original. It was important to me that it not just be for Christians, because a lot of the other sites that I have found out there are faith or former faith specific. And I think that that's great. Mm -hmm. I didn't find a, I didn't find very many like one site helps all sort of things. And my site is not going to help all. There's, there's way too many belief systems out. Sure. When I was putting on my business cap and leaving my heart cap aside for the moment, I was like, okay, what do I hone in on to make this site's demographic more clear and specific? So I'm writing to that one person. Right. Um, like I said, it was my younger self that I ended up wanting to make the site most for, knowing that there's so many other people out there who are exactly where I was. Yeah. So writing to my younger self really helped me focus that, okay, I'm writing to, it's welcoming to anyone. I want everyone to feel like they can go, but it was more millennial centric. Also, when I learned a lot of the data showing that, you know, millennials, like my, I'm 33 and my generation is the first to grow up with the internet. And that I think has so many, is, is probably the number one reason I would theorize why so many of us are leaving church more than any other generation previously. We just have so much more information and alternatives at our literal fingertips. And yeah. so I was like, okay, that will help me narrow the demographic a little bit. Right now I have, I think, five different belief systems that I have uh, resources for people who are in stages of doubt, Christianity, Judaism, Islam. Mormonism and Amish, because that one for some reason has just always been close to my heart. Um, yeah, and yeah. The sixth one is is broadly Eastern religions and spirit and inspired sure. groups, because that covers everything from transcendental meditation to harmful yoga cults. Yeah. And uh, the pages that I'm working on building right now, slowly but surely, are Jehovah's Witness and Catholicism. And there will be more too, but those are the ones that I'm mainly focusing on. And so I did not need all of these resources myself because I was not raised a Muslim. But I find, and this is so interesting to reflect on, but I find that when I started Dare to Doubt and I started getting more involved in the online community of ex believers, which I was not really previously, I Mm -hmm. find I have so much almost more in common emotionally 
with the ex-Muslims than I do the ex-Christians for some reason. Oh, interesting. I don't know why this is. Yeah. I, I, I was, because I noticed like the people that I'll, that I'll follow from my Dare to Doubt Twitter, I, it's, so, it's so interesting. Like, I'm not sure, I've been trying to think like, why, why is it that this really speaks to me in a way that this ex-Christian stuff doesn't? You know, it's like, of course, they both do on some level. And I wouldn't say that I identify with all of ex-Muslim things by any means. You know, that was, right. not, that was not my experience. But I don't know, it just, it's, I've been trying to find my place in this online ex-believer space. Yeah. It's a harsh world out there, man. <laughs> it sure is. <laughs> no, it's like, it's intense. I, like, what? I did not know what I was getting into with Dare to Doubt in that regard, in the social media regard. Like, it's intense. It's been very educational. Yeah. My boyfriends had to hear me talk about the Twitter atheist wars. I'm like, yeah. babe, I don't know about this space. Like, this is so interesting to me. You know, I feel... I, I once said in some comment on something that I made on Twitter that all of us are so different. We, we were so diverse as believers. We're all going to be very diverse as ex-believers. Right. But it, it's very interesting to me to observe the tendency still within all of us to fight for identity and a, set, a code of conduct that we can claim. Yeah. And who our enemies are. And who our enemies are. My, the next p- blog piece I'm working on is kind of about that, like, finding my space, finding the sort of atheist that I want to be in this space. And the, the atheist that I am in real life. Like, I don't like to get into big debates with people. Right. You know, like, I, I love a good, honest conversation. I love some, some sparring if someone's down. Like, I'll go there with you. Yeah. <laughs> I, you're going to need to really prove that, you're, that you really want that because right. I will. <laughs> like, yeah. I will go there. <laughs> and, it, you know, I don't want to make people feel... I don't like when people make me feel dumb. I don't right. want to go out of my way to make people feel dumb when I am not aware, to, to the best of my awareness, you know, like I know I'm going to offend people. I know I'm going to hurt people's feelings. Um, that's okay with me yeah. as long as I know that I've done the best I can. And I don't know, like I, I find it's just a, it's a, it is a tricky space to navigate. I think people are in very different stages of healing, very different stages of detachment, very different stages of identity and coming to peace with their past and also deciding what kind of future they want. Cause they're trying to find what space they're going to have for themselves and where they fit. And so it, it is, it is very interesting bouncing back and forth between my two Twitter feeds, my actress one, and then my dare to doubt one. Yeah. Totally different like <laughs> mental and emotional experience just on a casual peruse on my phone. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's like, there's a lot of heat out there and so understandably so, you know, I don't mean yeah. to, to, to come down on, on any of that. You know, I, I have so much compassion for it and I know I will indulge in it sometimes yeah, I yeah. Myself involved and I will tweet something I regret, you know, and like, I'll, I, I don't know. I think uh, one of my lessons that I've been trying to work on for myself is being okay with offending people. It's really painful for me you know it's yeah. like part of it is the oh but I want people to like me but it's also more than that it's like yeah we all like to be liked but like I really don't want to offend people you know like it's not just, intentionally not, not on not purpose intentionally, yeah, no. yeah. you know and and so it's a uh, it's hot, sometimes hard for me to feel like I can be my true self and be share who I am even though that's what I so encourage of others because I know I can take it, but sometimes right. I feel like other people might not be able to take me. And <laughs> you know, I, I'm like, oh man, but I have to be bold and, and be myself anyway. And, and I, I'm trying to get more comfortable with knowing that I will offend people. And it's yeah. a painful process, but it's a, uh, cause it also feels too good. It's like, ooh, ooh, ooh. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I always, I always say I love Twitter. I, I love Twitter, but it is the best and the worst of humanity all at the same time. And that Twitter draws out of me the worst of me as well. Mm-hmm. I'm all about, talk about this secular grace, this idea of mm-hmm. take, taking the idea of grace, but bringing it in without, without the religious connotations that we need to love each other, right? It's really that simple. Mm-hmm. And yet there are definitely times where I get dragged in <laughs> and I, I'm going to argue, I'm going to be, I'm going to be an <laughs> asshole. I'm going to do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and so like Twitter, definitely, I, there are many times where I think, okay, I need to just not look at that for a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
no one to step away. Like yeah. it's, it's so easy to get involved, you know, and, and like, even when you think you're just sticking up or just trying, even when you think you're trying to be gentle about something like, I don't know, maybe I, I try to ask myself, like, is this going to help, you know, more than it could right. hurt? Like, I don't know. I can't really be the judge of that, but. You're already way ahead of, of everybody else though. <laughs> just, <laughs> just asking that question. So. <laughs> So before we wrap up, I wanted to ask just a couple more questions. Mm -hmm. One we've kind of intimated about, we're talking, hinting about online communities and the fragility that exists there. Just because we've left re religion does not mean we don't need to belong somewhere to have mm -hmm. a sense of community. Where have you found community for yourself and do you have any recommendations for people going through the process? Ooh, first of all, I love that question. So I find my sense of community through my biological family and my chosen family. Um, I'm still very close to my parents and mm -hmm. I have four younger siblings, very close with them as well. Um, I have a sister who lives out in LA with me now. The rest of them are kind of scattered all over. And then my chosen family, my, my nearest and dearest friends, you know, I, I can count them on less than two hands, but they are like their family to me. And I think that's all that f at least to the, my awareness, I'll have to think about this more, but that's all the community that I'm aware that I really need. Mm -hmm. When I left Christianity and when I stopped, when I became an atheist and stopped looking at spiritual paths altogether, I was and remain very leery of groups, very leery of community in general. Ah, okay. I don't, I don't like the word community, to be honest with you. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. I was always told, oh, it's about community. You know, my yeah. parents were very, my dad was all very fond of saying, you know, church is wherever it's right here in the living room. You know, it's, it's, it's about community. And like, we didn't call potlucks potlucks. We called them common meals because it was community meals. Oh, wow. so community is just one of those words that, yeah. you know, I, yeah, it, it used to be a triggerful word. Now it's, it doesn't trigger me anymore. But, but that's a really interesting perspective <laughs> that I imagine many people still, still feel. So that's, that's fascinating. Yeah, I don't, I don't like, I don't like groups. I don't like anything where there's lots of people gathered. I think hierarchy is in human nature hierarchy will form in groups. And I don't like groups. I don't like leadership. I've I had a friend, a very well-meaning, wonderful, wonderful friend be like, I'll go with you to atheist church someday. And yeah. I feel so sweet of her because she's not an atheist, but she was like, meet me on my level. And I thought that was yeah. like such a kind gesture on her part. But I was thinking like, oh no, I, I have zero interest in going to any church period. <laughs> I'm very, very atheist. Like yes. I don't, I don't want to go to any gathering. Like, I don't know. Mm. I, like I've gotten, you know, bringing it back to the LA thing a little bit. LA is so infamously spiritual and with all of these weird, wacky little spiritual things, you know, from the Manson group on the more extreme end, yeah. you know, Kabbalism, which Madonna kind of made popular and not, mm -hmm. not on purpose, but you know, in the early 2000s, whatever, like LA is a very, it draws creatives, it draws artists. It's a yeah. city built on the entertainment industry. And so it draws very sensitive types that are usually more metaphysically inclined. And I, most of my friends believe in something. Right. I do have some, some friends that, do, that are a little more like me that would fall into a more atheist category. But for the most part, even within what I would say is my community, my family out here, like it's, it's still spiritually diverse and it's mm -hmm. taken a lot of conscious effort on my end to recognize my triggers and and to um, work on them by self-induced exposure therapy, <laughs> <laughs> for one. Also constantly reminding myself, like, this is not personal. This is not personal. This is not personal. Right. And people talk about, you know, having a moment with God or having some sort of spiritual or mystical experience. It would sometimes still tap into that nerve of like, how come I never got that? You know, like, yeah. How come your God is so selective about who he, she, them, it, whatever? You know, it's, it took me a long time to be comfortable in this L.A. spiritual space um, with, with where I'm at. And I, I'm, I'm so grateful that I would not say I am healed. I don't think that such a thing exists. But I, I would say I'm, I'm in a much, much better, stronger place where I'm able to not be as reactionary to the triggers when they are inadvertently stepped on. Like when a friend right. does use the word God or Jesus, I'm not like, <gasps> like yeah. instantly writing, you know, like freaking out. Now it's sort of, it's become amusing to me actually. Um, not, not amusing in like a patronizing sense, but just like a, Oh, how, how fascinating. Like that is real. Yeah. 
like, tell me more. <laughs> right. but, like, I'm a little more intrigued now because I feel so safely removed from it at this point, right. no longer as threatened. Now, if someone is actively trying to convert me um, or is telling me I'm going to go to hell, like, yeah, that'll push some buttons. That's that different. happened yeah. a long time, but I'm sure that would push some buttons still. Yeah, would, yeah. Does that answer your question? <laughs> So yeah, yeah, it does definitely. And I and, and so one one more question. We talked about the resources you have on your blog, but what specifically for you did you find uh, the most useful? Was there a book? Was it therapy? Was there? Yes. What was really meaningful for you in the deconversion process? So, for me, uh, secular therapy, mm -hmm. and uh, I found an amazing therapist who really helped me a lot. I tried like four or five before I found him, but I ended up seeing him yeah. for three years. And, you know, neither of us knew about religious trauma syndrome, but he still knew how to help me with what I now know were the effects of that, which, like I said, for me were suicidal ideation, panic attacks, self-harm, breaks in psychosis. I was having auditory hallucinations and, and like just a lot of yeah. dissociative states. Just my psyche was just, just shattered. Wow. And it took a long time for me to, to knit myself back together. And so the help of therapy for sure. And then when I did learn about religious trauma syndrome, I immediately had to find out like, who is this psychologist that came up with this? Dr. Marlene Winnell, I will always be so infinitely grateful to for giving a name to the experience I was going through and what I know so many others go through. And mm -hmm. I read her book, Leaving the fold. In the fold. Yeah, I read it right away and I was just weeping throughout. And I, I, by that point, I'd been out for several years and I recognized ways that I'd already begun to heal. But I, it also showed me like, oh man, I still have like so much further to go. And it, but it really, and I may always, and that's, that's okay with me. It's, it's part of my, it's part of my fabric and, and I embrace it. And if it allows me to help other people, also going through that, then I'm, I'm so happy to, to be able to have that, that privilege. Um, but yeah, I would say, so I, I feature Dr. Winnell's work, her website, Journey Free, mm -hmm. uh, where she, uh, I have not done one of her retreats yet, but I mentioned she offers group retreats for people reclaiming themselves. And I think her book, Leaving the Fold, is her own background is Christian, but I think that it speaks to the deconstruction, deconversion process of anyone. So yeah. her, her work is featured heavily on Dare to Doubt. Because I started Dare to Doubt this year, 12 years after I needed it, I guess. <laughs> it's yeah. hard for, I, I can't say that I've used many of the resources that are on the site myself. Sure. Because many of them are new. I didn't know about the secular therapy project. Um, I didn't know about recovery from religion. And honestly, again, getting back to my aversion to community, this extends to online space too. And I think yeah. for a long time, I didn't want, I was never curious about ex-Christian groups or meetups with other fellow ex-evangelicals or anything. Like I, I was just like, mm, no, no, yeah. no, no. <laughs> um, yeah. Now I've, I'm coming to a place where I'm, again, I'm, I'm, I, I feel more open to approaching it from the more curious amusement, a, a more like sincere, like, oh, you know, like, I do very much want to hear other people's stories. I'd love to hear if you have time when we're done. <laughs> yeah. But, but yeah, I, I do. It's, I, it's, the, it's the group label or community. There's something in there that I, that I definitely recognize as baggage. There's something in there that even though I recognize how much an online community has helped other people in their process. That was not my journey. My journey was much more one-on-one -on -one with a therapist, mm -hmm. which felt much safer to me. Yeah. I think a lot of my, my issues that came up in therapy where I don't, I have a very difficult time trusting people. I, I feel bad saying that, but I do. Same. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like a, a lot of us do. And I think, I think that's why I was so reluctant to get involved in any space, whether in real life or online where it was like, oh man, we're it's just more people. And same mm -hmm. with like acting classes, like I was saying earlier, like a lot yeah. of acting classes even reminded me of cults or women's groups. I can't tell you how many women's things I've been invited to, whether it's like a full moon women's party, you know, <laughs> yeah. what I, I am so creeped out by those. I'm like, yeah, thank yeah. you so much, but no, I'm <laughs> because it's just like, it's so, it's so strange to me. Yeah. I, the, the rationalist in me is like, Oh, humans like to gather. We like to have order and hierarchy and, and do th yeah. things as groups. And the other part of me is like, why do I need? I, I, no, that no, yeah. that's so that says nothing but dangerous to me. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's interesting, and I can't tell. I still can't tell which is wisdom and which is fear. Right. 
changing my reaction to not wanting to get involved with groups. Um, I like one-on-one -on -one relationships. I like connecting with people one-on-one. -on -one. I like healing in a more one-on-one -on -one setting. Yeah. We're introverted by nature. So I think I'm just, I'm, I'm just not a group person in general. <laughs> yeah, me too. And this is actually why I started the podcast was like, I recognize I needed some of this for myself. And I wa I've watched the online communities just crumble, you know, in just the four or five years, you know, I've seen probably six or seven different communities crash. Yeah. Part of it is that I'm convinced that, you know, online is, it gives us a simulacrum of community. It gives, it gives you part of it, but not all of it. Yeah. And so I love the way you say the family you chose, right? Your friends is yeah. your community. And I, I actually think that that is the healthier direction to go. So. <laughs> This has been great, but I want to give you an opportunity to tell people how they can reach you. What's your online presence? Uh, what's the uh, Dare to Doubt site? Yes. So you can find Dare to Doubt at daretodoubt.org. No numbers, just dare, D-A-R-E-T-O-D-O-U-B-T.org. And that's the same thing for Instagram and Twitter at Dare to Doubt. I keep trying to make a Facebook page for it, but Facebook keeps kicking me out. I don't know why. <laughs> Maybe I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm so frustrated <laughs> with Facebook too, yeah. Yeah, I, it's, yeah, whatever. But for now, you can find um, Dare to Doubt on Twitter and Instagram. And then for myself, my personal slash acting slash reading all the other things I'm into on Instagram is at Alice Gretchen. That's my name, and it's spelled A-L-I-C-E. G-R-E-C is -E in cat, Z is in zebra, Y, N is in Nancy. It's Polish, but it's really easy to pronounce. It's just like the girl's first name, Gretchen. Yeah. Um, and then on Twitter, I'm Alice Food, which is even easier. And this is where you'll discover that Alice is actually really famous. <laughs> <laughs> hardly, hardly. No, I haven't worked as an actor in a few years. Like it's, it's a, I, I had a really lucky streak in my 20s and like my, early, my late teens, early 20s. And so most of the fan base I have is still from that way back then and just oh, like really loyal fans who've followed me to all the other places my life has gone. I still audition for acting, less more so. I'm focused on a lot of other things right now, including Dare to Doubt. Yeah. But I'm also just waiting to kind of grow out of the, the awkward phase where you're too old to play a teenager, but still too young looking to believe you play <laughs> a boy or a doctor. I can't quite play a grown up yet. So <laughs> yeah. I'm it's like I am a grown up, but I, I'm yeah. fortunate enough to look young enough to to play for younger roles. So it's getting out of that awkward stage, writing it out. Uh, well, good luck to you on on all fronts. Uh, again, I just want, I really encourage all the listeners that uh, Dare to Doubt's an amazing resource. It's incredibly well produced too. I don't know if you're doing all your technical work. Thank you. I am. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's beautiful. It's got. It's well organized. Very, very well done. I'm, I'm a tech guy. I'm impressed. The, the design aesthetic, everything is great about it. So thank you so much. Yeah. So check that out. So Alice, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Final thoughts on the episode. Wow. This was a fun one. You could tell that uh, Alice is very good at connecting with people. And a couple of times there, she reversed the roles and asked me some questions. And you could tell that she's very good at that. I think that kind of heart comes through in her writing on the Dare to Doubt blog and is more than clear in this interview. Her story of a near arranged marriage was incredible. I can't imagine having the kind of social pressure and the purity culture, Christian courtship pressure that she must have been under. It was fascinating that she talked about the Jesus Camp documentary that was a spark for her deconversion. I also loved the way she said that she felt like she had to fake spiritual experiences because the people around her appeared to be having some kind of experience that she didn't feel was real. And as I pointed out to her in the interview, I think that's because of her honesty it's the honest ones who are unable to pretend like something less than the real thing is real. Several quotes come to mind. She says, I became not so great at lying to myself. And she began to recognize when she was trying to make things happen. She recognized that all the other spiritual paths also required faith. And she could not lie to herself anymore because she knew she was lying to herself. And I love this quote the most. I feel so much more love and so much more peace as an atheist than I ever felt as a Christian. 
And finally, I'm very thankful for the work that Alice does because of what she described herself, that very few women identify as atheists, and yet there are probably many, many non-believing women who just are uncomfortable with that term. And I think someone like Alice makes that a tangible and approachable reality. Women can recognize themselves in her work, and I think she's a great ambassador and a bridge for maybe the non-believing women who are uncomfortable coming all the way to say that they are atheists. And even more, those women who might find themselves in a situation where they are faking it till they make it. They don't really believe, and yet they are going through the motions. This hopefully will give them the freedom to say, I don't believe. I'm an atheist. I related so much when she talked about her distrust for communities and groups. I find that is difficult, even though I am convinced that we need that as human beings, that we need to find communities. It is hard to do after you've gone through the deconversion process and maybe you've been hurt by a community. It was really interesting to hear that even in just an acting class, you can have the same kind of bad behavior that you might see in a church. And it seems like we don't go through a podcast episode without mentioning the Recovery From Religion organization. If you need someone to talk to, for any reason, you can give them a call and somebody will be on the line to chat with you. As Alice mentions, the Secular Therapy Project, which is a part of the Recovery from Religion organization, is a way for you to find a therapist that you can guarantee is going to be of a secular mindset and is not going to impose a faith tradition on you. So if you're looking for a therapist, that is definitely a way to start. We'll have links in the show notes. As well as Alice's Dare to Doubt blog itself, there are a number of resources she has on her site, and we'll have links for that as well. I do ask you to go and check out the Dare to Doubt site. It's well worth your time. I want to thank Alice for being on the podcast and for her honesty and vulnerability and her willingness to put herself out there for others to benefit from her experience and wisdom. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Look forward to upcoming episodes in the next couple of weeks. I hope you'll join me next time on the Graceful Atheist Podcast. Time for some footnotes. The song is a track called Waves by Micaiah Beats. Please check out her music. Links will be in the show notes. If you'd like to help support the podcast, here are the ways you can go about that. First, help promote it. The podcast audience grows by word of mouth. If you found it useful or just entertaining, please pass it on to your friends and family. Post about it on social media so that others can find it. Please rate and review the podcast wherever you get your podcasts. This will help raise the visibility of our show. Join me on the podcast. Tell your story. Have you gone through a faith transition? You want to tell that to the world? Let me know and let's have you on. Do you know someone who needs to tell their story? Let them know. Do you have criticisms about atheism or humanism, but you're willing to have an honesty contest with me? Come on the show. If you have a book or a blog that you want to promote, I'd like to hear from you. Also, you can contribute technical support. If you are good at graphic design, sound engineering, or marketing, please let me know and I'll let you know how you can participate. And finally, financial support. There will be a link on the show notes to allow contributions which would help defray the cost of producing the show. If you want to get in touch with me, you can Google Graceful Atheist, or you can send email to gracefulatheist at gmail.com. You can tweet at me at gracefulatheist, or you can just check out my website at gracefulatheist.wordpress.com. Get in touch and let me know if you appreciate the podcast. Well, this has been the Graceful Atheist Podcast. My name is David, and I am trying to be the Graceful Atheist. Grab somebody you love and tell them how much they mean to you. This has been the Graceful Atheist Podcast.